So I was sitting at my favorite reading chair doing some reading, but I had this idea stuck in my head about an Arduino fiction book. It's something that I'd been thinking about for years. Thing is, I love prototyping with Arduino, but I also love to read. So I'm like, what if we could mash these ideas together? Like Tex-Mex, we could make a fun fiction story about Arduino stuff. So I finally reached out to a writer who it turns out was an electronics geek at heart, and I told him about this premise that I had. What I realized pretty quickly was the story that I had in mind was nothing like the story that was being written. It was a whole lot better. So we hired an illustrator who had mentored under a Marvel artist to work on some graphics. At first, we were just gonna do like one picture per chapter, but then Josh, our video editor, thought, hey, these pictures are great. Let's turn this thing into a graphic novel. So we have a book or a graphic novel. It's about a washed up theoretical physicist who gets hired by a company of ill repute to build something he doesn't know. Along the way, he gets help from his electronics hobbyist dad and a coworker who's trying to solve a decades old mystery. What you're watching right now is a voiceover of the book. It's basically, this is an audiobook with pictures in it. Maybe this is like a pictorama. I don't know what you call it. Anyway, that's what you're watching. We're gonna be releasing chapters of this book on our YouTube channel. If you wanna buy the book yourself, and it's a great way to support our channel, just go to the link in the description. You can pick up the book on Amazon. The Kindle version's also available, and we'll be releasing the audiobook version there as well. If you know somebody who likes sci-fi, enjoys reading, maybe into Arduino stuff, tell them about the book. We'd really appreciate it. Well, without further ado, here is the prelude to the Arduino Paradox. The Arduino Paradox, Prototyper Chronicles, Index Equals Zero, by Mark Lambert, illustrated by Brandon Scribner, narrated by Brian Safara. Prelude, Black Institutional Coffee and the Liquid Blue Shockwave of Elysium. It was a shade past midnight. Not that the concept of time meant much in the eternally shadowless chromescape of a vast subterranean laboratory far beneath the streets of a sleeping city. A small group of tired-looking men and women huddled over a laptop. Clad in lab coats, they spoke in hushed tones as together they scrutinized a complex array of graphs, reports, and readouts. Every so often, one of the experimental team would lift their head to glance across to a man lying motionless on a stainless steel examination table in the center of the room. This man was the test subject. He was why they were here. No one there knew his name. They knew everything else about this man. His blood type, his weight, the length of his fingernails, the complicated latticework of his subtle neurochemistry. Each member of the team could effortlessly list off what the test subject had eaten over the last month right down to the calorie. But the test subject's name? That was information well beyond any of their pay grades. The test subject groaned, his back arched as he writhed on the examination table, and a battery of medical units strapped to his body screeched an electronic alarm. LEDs speckled across the visor covering the test subject's face, lit up with a brief violent display of electronics fireworks, and then went dark. Alarms sounded, computers spat out error messages, and complex machineries clustered on the laboratory floor ground to a halt. Lab coats rushed into action. No! The test subject's voice came out hoarse, the dry, cracked sound of a human who hadn't spoken in days. Then a medic's nitro-gloved hands hovered over his agonized form, clasping a syringe filled with a neon blue liquid shockwave of chemical elysium. Deftly, the medic punctured the test subject's vein and drove the liquid home. The sweat-drenched man sighed and lay back on the examination table. Tech personnel rushed in to remove devices strapped to the helpless man's body while medics stabilized him. A hush finally fell over the room. The experimental team stared wide-eyed at one another, chests rising and falling fast in the aftermath of their shared adrenaline-spiked freefall. Another close call had come and gone. The lead experimentalist sighed and slumped in a chair, exhausted. He pinched the bridge of his nose, 
and drained the last cold dregs of bitter black institutional coffee. Failure again at 57%, he said quietly. A scribe entered the result into a laptop. It was the latest in a long, long line of dutifully recorded disappointments. The lead experimentalist sat back in his chair and surveyed the exhausted faces of each member of his team. Then his eyes strayed across to the test subject, now blissfully unconscious, and at the beginning of another long bout of mental and physical recovery. This isn't working, he said. Heads around him slowly nodded. He lifted his gaze to the security camera in the corner of the room and saw that it was firmly trained on him. He stared into the abyss that lay beyond its lens and spoke to the ever-observing mind that lived there. It's time we came up with a plan B. Introduction, Ezekiel and the Bulldog Clip of Destiny. Dr. Ezekiel Trobador woke up to a shrill metallic beeping Again, he grunted in distress, half forming the notion that the noise had been happening for some time. Ezekiel, Zeke to his friends, of which there were three, including his dad, dragged a large, overstuffed Star Trek themed pillow over his head. Something sounding like the word no emerged from inside the pillow's warm, feathery innards. Time passed. The noise didn't. A trembling fist emerged from under the covers and slammed down on the faded red stop button of a vintage 1980s PQ-30 digital alarm clock. The noise stopped. A thin individual with a shock of unruly brown hair groaned, sat up, and looked around his bedroom. Scratching various parts of his anatomy, he reached for his bedside table and slid on an oversized pair of black-framed spectacles. Ezekiel, Dr. Trobador to his colleagues, of which there were currently none, glowered at the fractured artifact of vintage timekeeping electronica that now lay dangling on its cord like a criminal from the hangman's noose. 10.15 a.m. The alarm clock display flickered up at him in its last death throes. Late already. Again. Mumbling to himself about time and the questionable nature of reality, Ezekiel threw on a nondescript pair of baggy sweatpants. He chugged a glass of water over his kitchen sink, scooped the various parts of his alarm clock into a plastic bag, and stumbled outside his front door. It was Tuesday, and he was late for breakfast. Running his hands through his thick shock of frazzled hair and blinking his sleep-drenched eyes back into focus, Ezekiel scuffed his way up two flights of narrow, 60s-era apartment block-style stairwell. He tapped his knuckles on a familiar door, yawned, and stepped inside. Oh, yep, son. A waft of sizzling bacon assailed Ezekiel's nostrils. Jim Trobador emerged from a well-lit kitchen. You're late. Ezekiel's dad waved an oil-slicked cooking spatula in his son's direction. Yeah, late night. Looks it, Jim grinned. Come and help your old man make breakfast. Fifteen minutes later, Ezekiel sat at a small linoleum table across from his portly progenitor. He gazed down at a plate mountain of bacon, eggs, and an assortment of fried things he struggled to recognize. How was his dad not a small, cholesterol-fueled blimp? Jim raised an eyebrow and pointed a fork dripping with egg yolk at the plastic bag filled with alarm clock bits Ezekiel had placed beside him on the table. Problem with the old alarm clock? Yeah. Ezekiel mumbled around a bite of bacon. Yeah, It fell apart. Mmm. Just fell apart, did it? Jim's eyes narrowed. Mm, don't know what to tell you, Ezekiel said, shoveling a bit too much egg into his mouth. I just gently pressed the stop button. Uh, maybe old electronic devices aren't as reliable as you keep going on about. Jim grunted, then mumbled nerdish things about resistors, and he poked through the dead clock's plastic casing and dusty circuitry with his butter knife. It'll take some work, but I'll fix it for you he intoned. 
An unsettling glee crept into blue eyes twinkling from beneath gray, bushy eyebrows. I picked up a new soldering iron the other day. It'll be perfect for this job. Remind me to show it to you later. It's a real beauty. I can just use my smartphone, Dad. It's got a built-in alarm, volume controls, and everything. I'll fix it for you, he repeated, raising his yoke-drenched fork to signal the subject was now closed. Conversations like these always ended the same way. The two ate in silence to an old rerun of MacGyver, far better than the newer version, Jim assured his son loudly and often. When their enormous mountains of food had become molehills, Jim cleared his throat. <clears throat> so, Ezekiel's shoulders tightened. How's the job hunt going? Dad. Now don't get all uppity, Jim said as he got up and cleared the plates. A man's allowed to ask innocent questions about his son's vocational prospects, isn't he? Silence reigned as MacGyver fixed a helicopter with a coat hanger. Isn't he? Ezekiel Grudge nodded. He wished he could explain. For years of his life, his gaze had been fixed on one thing to the exclusion of all else, including hygiene, money, and relationships, though not always in that order. The moment he started his PhD in physics, Dr. Ezekiel Q. Trobador knew, with every fiber of his bespectacled being, that he had something new and original to say. No one, himself included, understood exactly what he had proven when he submitted his PhD, neatly bound and in triplicate, to the Academic Assessment Board. Blending metaphysics with physics and Zen philosophy with a mountain of quantum mechanics, Ezekiel had shown, conclusively, mind you, that a causal phenomena were real. What did that mean, precisely? This was a question Ezekiel had become all too used to hearing. When pushed to simplify, Ezekiel would explain that it meant that an event, and the stuff that caused that event, could happen backwards. At first, Ezekiel could only prove it at a minuscule scale. A subatomic particle could move because it bumped itself. But step by logical step, he bridged the gap to the world at large. By the time his thesis came back from the printer with its classy purple faux leather cover, Ezekiel was able to present a string of mathematical formulae that demonstrated, as surely as 2 plus 2 usually equals 4, that a person could know something in advance because it was about to happen. It also meant, theoretically at least, that you could build a device that responded to a future input because it was going to happen. That's where things got interesting, in a final flourish, his thesis proposed an experimental method that anyone could reproduce with basic electronic components. Rather grandly, he named his theoretical invention the Synchronostic Effectuator. The consequences of Ezekiel's study were ridiculous and far-reaching, if a little bit terrifying. Everyone agreed it was a triumph of intellectual inquiry, but there was a problem. No one knew quite what to do next. And then the world just moved on. And when the awards and acclaim didn't arrive, Ezekiel found himself lost and aimless, not quite willing to leave academia, but just as unwilling to dive into a more practical existence, where money, girlfriends, and hygiene happened. Again, not necessarily in that order. Jim sighed rubbing his hands on his The A-Team apron and looking concerned as only a father with big eyebrows can. <sighs> Listen, son, I'm not going to pretend I understand your PhD stuff, he said, making annoying air quotes in the air around the acronym. But you're wicked smart, and if you could just... Dad... No, hear me out. Maybe a real job is what you need right now, you know? to dust the cobwebs off that massive brain of yours. You've had your head up in the clouds so long. I had a real job. I was a theoretical physicist. But I mean real, real. Like in electronics, or at a hardware store, or something. You know, where you make and sell some normal stuff. 
Jim trailed off as his son stood up from the table. The pair walked together to Jim's front door. Jim squeezed the taller man's shoulder. Sorry, son. I was out of line. Ezekiel pushed his glasses up his nose and squared his shoulders. Nah, you're right, Dad. It's time I got on with life. I'll start looking for work tomorrow. Promise. Ezekiel smiled, a twitch at the corner of his mouth betraying how hard the words had been to say. You gonna fix that alarm clock for me, right? You know it, Jim beamed. As Jim's door closed behind him, Ezekiel plodded back downstairs, feeling a few pounds heavier around the stomach and a few pounds lighter around the shoulders. Maybe a job at the local hardware store might be fun. He half pondered, but that was for later. His immediate plan was to digest his breakfast while catching the rest of that MacGyver episode. Ezekiel opened his apartment door and stepped inside. Something crunched underfoot. He looked down at a large yellow envelope around his room as though some invisible roommate might materialize with a simple explanation. He picked the envelope up, feeling its bulk. Definitely not junk mail. A chunky bulldog clip in one corner hinted at the hefty seriousness of the document therein. He flipped the envelope over. Attention, Dr. Ezekiel Q. Trobador. Confidential. Ripping it open, Ezekiel gazed down at a cover letter printed on crisp legal paper. He squinted at the embossed logo. It looked a bit like a stylized LED, its two uneven prongs piercing a globe of planet Earth. Dear Dr. Trobador, we would like to offer you an internship with an exciting new electronics prototyping program. Your starting salary will be $50,000 per year with a generous bonus package effective on completion of the program. Confused, he scanned down the page past a few solid paragraphs of corporate policy gobbledygook to a closing signature scrawled in big, confident cursive. Tigron Hesk, CEO, Protojo Corporation. And then underneath the signature block, a postscript penned with the same crazed chicken scratching. P.S. Your first day is tomorrow at 9 a.m. Don't be late, Dr. Trobador. Get a better alarm clock if you have to. Your company handbook is attached. P.P.S. Oh, and ditch the track pants. Ezekiel blinked. How odd. He felt a shivering thrill as he set the packet down and gazed out his window at the quiet tree-lined street below. Oz and effect. Practice and theory. Old MacGyver, new MacGyver. It all swirled in his mind as he pondered the strangeness of fat yellow envelopes. Ezekiel unclasped the bulldog clip of destiny. Maybe a job at the local hardware store could wait. Thanks a ton for watching. You can head over to Amazon to purchase this book. It would really help support our channel. Thanks a lot. Have a great one.